but do it in a way that's rational and affordable and safe. And I don't think that's a trivial thing to do. Well, that's a pretty hopeful, that's a, I like that. It's a, it's a good framing way to end this session. Any closing thoughts from our panels? If not, please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to the panel and to this very skilled um, uh, moderation by Anish. Uh, what a terrific foundation, uh, conceptually, intellectually, uh, inspirationally, uh, to lead us uh, to our wrap-up conversation uh, and uh, to guide us in that wrap-up conversation uh, we're going to turn to uh, the man who brought us here, in many ways, uh, Peter Provenos. So, Peter, can I invite you up here? Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you all for, uh, I think, a really a, a amazing day. The conversation shows the complexity of the, the issues we're trying to solve. And if I think about what best summarizes the day, I'm reminded of Mary Poppins. And how many of you have seen Mary Poppins? And you probably have noticed in the background throughout the whole play or movie are all these birds chirping all the time when she walks in the park, when she flies down. And that was true because in the late 40s, London was full of two types of melodious songbirds, the red robins and the blue boobies. And they thrived in London because they used to peck through the tops of the mill containers that were left on people's stoops. They sucked through the fat on the top and they were really plump, really happy songbirds. But then in the early 50s, the mill companies changed their containers and they went from cardboard and steeple to aluminum and flat. And both birds were equally smart. And a few of both birds learned how to peck through the new aluminum. They had to tuck their beak a little bit differently. But the red robins went extinct. They don't live in London anymore. The blue boobies thrive. And they thrive, or the red robins went extinct, because they're solitary birds. They have their stoop or their corner. We call it our market sector. And that wisdom of how to peck through the top never disseminated through their community. It died with those few birds. The blue boobies, on the other hand, are flocking birds, and that knowledge quickly disseminated through them. They all learned the new technique, and they thrive to this day. And I think about what we heard today was a lot of efforts on many well-intentioned people, I think all well-intentioned people, trying to move this agenda. But we saw in the paper today Amazon, J.P. Morgan, and Berkshire Hathaway saying, we're not cutting it for a reduction in health care costs. It's up 4.6% a year more than the GDP. Harm is still unacceptably high, and yet we have over 90% penetration of electronic health records, as the uh, AMA Chantel has shared with us. So we have to be more like blue boobies that think that silo piece isn't getting us where. A lot of great conversation about thinking like an engineer and make my own mistakes saying the goal is an interoperability, the goal is value and population health, and that's a means to get there. And I think that's a really important messaging thing that we'll revise in the paper, that ultimately it's, you have to get data in. Importantly, you have to get it out. And as Doug, you said, increasingly it'll be patient data that is, is going to be driving. But the end game is value and, and, and population health. We saw an enormous market opportunity that Secretary Shulkin asked for help and Admiral Bono with the DOD making enormous purchases that I think is a market opportunity that it hasn't existed before to say, could we think to do something different in these that might ultimately reframe the model? And Doug, to go back to your point to say, you know, maybe the simple mindset is just accepting that the data belong to patients. Because if you free up that concept in this, it, it ch changes how we think about l l letting the data uh, flow. We heard, though, from submarines and from the cable industries that they uh, had to migrate to get data to be interoperable, and it wasn't easy. And 
yes, regulations are important, and yes, standards are important, but at the end of the day, what it took was hard leadership and negotiating, and uh, though trust is important, th some of these were contracting things to say, how is the data going to flow? And Renee, we heard your story of that, that it's not easy, that despite what seems like a brilliant idea, I love you know, sh sharing s the immunization records with the health centers and the stu schools, uh, it wasn't executed for, for a variety of, of, of different reasons. And actually, I love the phrase of the murky middle because much of what we're talking about is in that murky middle and we're going to have to find our way. The guideposts are perhaps going to be obscured and, and the regulations will evolve. And finally, as many of you have said throughout the day, that this isn't one lever. Big change that we have, there's never one lever that's going to be enough. We'll be pulling multiple levers that are going to drive the change. The question is, are they pulling in their own sandboxes so they're not going in the right direction? And some may argue why we haven't seen value, or could we better align those so that we do pull in a synergistic way to move the needle for the U.S. public? In the report that we put forth, we hypothesize that uh, the procurement piece, though by no means the only lever, is an under-leveraged lever right now in, in, in healthcare. And I heard, I think we heard a lot of examples of that's true. And Jim, you, you gave some examples of how uh, we think we, we could do better uh, on that. Meredith, perhaps most powerfully was your stack of stories to say, yes, we've done all this stuff, but at the end of the day, this is how you still have to manage, and there has to be a better way for the for the uh, patients we serve. So the question for the audience is: is I know the uh, Dr. McGinnis and the IOM saw this convening as not as an end, but a means to say how do we accelerate this really important journey in healthcare? Because there's been a ridiculous number of reports on interoperability and the need for it, and many IOM panels, many other private sectors. The reality is we haven't accelerated it to the extent that we need to. We think there is this existential crisis with healthcare costs and the moral failure of the number of people harmed. So what might be some next steps that a group that, that we might recommend? We put forth this framework of uh, commit identify some use cases, collaborate, because none of us will have the resources to do this alone, sp specify and assess. And I think having the CEOs here and the leadership, I'm f fairly convinced that it sounds like the healthcare leadership believes that there's a, a, a need for this. Julie, and you had identified, I think, some relatively, I would say easy, but very clear use cases that there are success stories that could be built upon that requirements could be um, put forth. And so my request or idea for the group to consider is might we be at that collaborating stage where somebody might be willing to convene or we might begin to convene to say what might we write some more specific requirements, in my view, that should sit in the public domain that if MGH wants to use them as a starting point, they could tweak, or HCA, or the VA and, and, and DOD, or, or consumer groups, but that we begin in a more uh, cohesive way to be more like blue boobies, break those silos, and begin to mature some specifications. Obviously, Andy, building upon all the great s standards work, my deep belief is the standards work has matured much more in the regulation than the procurement work pieces, and I think we could rebalance that conversation. So let me put that proposal out to the audience for reactions or comments. Yeah, great point. And that's the point, you know, of what we heard about 
Julia's point about reducing barriers to entry and I think some of these open standards completely do that because they encourage, they create a marketplace for innovation. And that's... Right. It's a great point. Yeah, it's a great point. We'll make sure we add that. Michael? Right. 
Great, thank you. And Michael, you know, you make a great point, and our Google colleagues were doing this, that it, we discussed usability, I mean, interoperability, but the usability, or what I would call sense-making of the data, is as important of getting value out of it. I mean, it's a whole separate of issues, but how you present Meredith's, you know, eight-inch stack of paper in a way that I could find what I need in it is a, is a whole another piece of, uh, we think that will come once you free up the data and the smart folks who are doing all this machine learning can figure that out. Julian? First of all, uh, thanks again for the work you've done to convene this and great summary of the day. A um, Couple of thoughts about the idea of how to use use cases like this or clinical scenarios. Uh, number one, absolutely would be delighted to share all that we've um, accumulated. Some of them are, are analyzed in great detail uh, with engineering requirements, others are higher level uh, use cases, but those are, we have to maybe figure out the best means to handle the, the communication, you know, from a kind of workload standpoint, but as far as the core content, it's all uh, absolutely available for the community to use, um, and I look forward to sharing it. So that's number one. Thank you. Thanks for suggesting it. Um, second of all, I've been involved with a number of organizations that have tried to develop uh, either interoperability or some other capabilities like that based upon use cases. And one, the one place where they, uh, they typically sh fall short is that uh, use cases are proposed by end users, may, they might be providers or organizations, and then there's another step that occurs in which those use cases are vetted uh, and assessed for feasibility or implementability. And what often happens at that point are either it's raised that that's we can't do that, it's too complicated. Existing equipment or technology is unable to do that, so let's park it for some future consideration, which means goes into the shredder, uh, electronic shredder. And uh, that's, that's one thing that happens. And the other thing that, that typically happens is uh, that the group cannot find the resources to implement some right. capabilities because they say, well, no one in this group is producing a product in that category. Those are the two means the two pathways that this fails, and I've seen it fail about four or five times in different organizations. But I, so I think that it's important for us to be vigilant to, to not let our vision and our needs for delivering better quality of care, better value of care, better safety be compromised, uh, understanding that there will, it's a long, it may be a long pathway for some of these. So that's, sorry, that's kind of one chunk for a message. The other speaks to some of the comments about the different workflows, unique um, environments, different devices. It's, it's, it's essential to capture all of these uh, voices, uh, all of these needs, and all these environments. But for those who might think, uh-oh, we're going to have a list that's you know, 300 use cases long, we'll never get through it. The fact is, I went through this exercise a few years ago under the, uh, an NIH grant, and we started off with, I don't know, 60, 80 different considerations in a big spreadsheet and boiled it down to five use cases that, if solved, took care of a, maybe 100 different needs. So it's a little bit like Legos, and you don't have to solve it all at once. And the standards are incomplete. Most, almost all the standards are incomplete. But the standards organizations, when they understand what's incomplete, or they can, as they can assess that, Excellent. and then they, they can fix the problem if they're motivated through this enormous vision of procurement that we heard about today. Uh, Great, too, and that's a great, and the standards, I think, as we emerge, will always be incomplete, because there'll be an ever further use case that pushes us f further down towards social determinants of health and freeing up the data. Other comments or ideas? Jim? Just piggybacking on the use case, I understand that we don't want to constrain ourselves, but when you look at it through the procurement lens, if we're thinking about where to start, uh, the reason I'd support a group, the right group, the, you know, and that would be those who either pay for or are receiving or delivering care could convene to determine kind of where to start, then that helps actually, part of that where to start might be what's the state of the technologies vendors that are in that space. If none mm -hmm. of them are anywhere close to um, being able to meet this, that may be a bigger lift. So I was just gonna endorse a place that HCA might start is, is if we had something that made sense to focus on as a beginning that was driven by the care that's being delivered or the consequences of value around it, that, that would be a good place to start because it would lead to immediate ability to test the model 
right? Of the steering committee and the language that goes into those agreements. And Jim, just to, to build that out further, who are those right people, right? That who would you, like, if you were to say, okay, we want to convene someone to begin to, to further this, who would you have at the table? Uh, I mean, I would have broadly speaking, painting with the broad brush, I would have meaningful representatives of, of patients and families who receive care in communities. I would have, um, you know, employers who, who are self-insured who are responsible for getting value back in the care. Mm -hmm. And I would have a variety of, of uh, representatives from those who deliver the care, practices, uh, urgent care, um, hospital systems, et cetera. Because th those largely are the, uh, are the ones that would, who would be the purchasers right. who, would, who would need to apply it in the workflow. Right. And therefore, pr procurement, right. have a reason to procure. And then have that facilitated so there's some concrete output about some of these uh, standards or use cases. Yeah, then you could follow up whether nothing happened or not. Right. You know, because there'd be a reason for something to happen. And uh, we'd learn a lot, too, I think. And we'd, we'd have to be careful not to have it so constrained around those use cases. Right. But at least uh, the procurement offices would have a reason to pay attention because it was something that they actually cared about in the current landscape and something that was doable where they're not suddenly doing contract language around a niche area where none of the vendors are anywhere close to, there's right. no one they can pick, um, that would have to, right. that would help, help make it successful. Right, and given the timeline of VA and DOD's contracting, that something like that could potentially inform their really important work that they're doing now. Other comments? Um, so Rob, Cliff Weck speaking again. Just as, as someone who receives a lot of the RFPs and, and looks at them, part of my role at Epic is to look through some of the interoperability stuff in the procurement process. Uh, just generally speaking, um, they're low asks. Right. Uh, you know, like we already exceed all of it. And so I applaud this effort to actually put more in there because I, I think when, when the question to me was what, what's the incentivizer or whatever, it, it, I stumbled on that because I'm like, I, I, it's just so ingrained in me. It's what I've been doing for the last decade and a half. And so it's like, of course, interoperability saves time, saves money. It reduces the cost of care. It speeds up care. It gives you greater access to care. Like it's just so many reasons that seem obvious. And, and that's partly just because I've been living it for so long. So I apologized earlier, but I do applaud the work here in trying to raise the bar in the procurement process. I completely agree it's not the only lever. You gotta have a lot of other things, but it's certainly one that, that should be raised. Well, th thank you for that uh, very generous comment because I, you know, our hypothesis was, right, we're not putting those detailed specifications like would have existed in other industries. And to hear from the, you know, an industry leader that that's the case is really validating to this. So thank you very much and for being part of the process and, and also our other colleagues also. If that. <laughs> Yeah, great point. And the, AM, the NAM had a report on that about the, about how the disease categories don't count, don't capture things like frailty or what really are impacting our patients. Other comments or 
suggestions? All right, so we will take this feedback uh, and thank you for your uh, uh, time and your really commitment to move the needle on this. We'll incorporate them into the report and then we'll explore what might be some uh, next steps because I, I liked your suggestion, Jim, about bringing a group together to see if we could mature this, fully recognizing that it's a piece of the puzzle. It's one lever, but at least it's f furthering the, the direction in the right way. So, oh. Ed? So on behalf of Dr. John's uh, part of the writing team, um, he wanted me to say a few words on his thought and his offer to this group. Uh, although I got to tell you, you know, if you have the CEO of medical interoperability in your title, <laughs> I don't know whether to be petrified or exhilarated. But in the spirit of uh, ye who leads is the leader, uh, here's what we have to offer. In conjunction with all of the feedback on the paper, which uh, Claire, who's done such a great job coordinating in the writing team, We'll work to consolidate all the feedback into the paper and make it a more comprehensive paper. But we also uh, offer to sponsor the next gathering. And the next gathering will be a gathering of the CEOs. I've got 14 of them on my board. I've got the permission to invite a, probably a similar number from the solution providers to include the medical device vendors, the electronic medical record vendors, and the innovators out there. And it's an observation that uh, we made when I was fortunate enough to take a year to study the other industries before we launched the center. In every industry that created a centralized lab, it came down to between five and eight individuals who made it happen. It wasn't all buyers and suppliers. It was the executives that had the power to make a decision that, you know, at a time when the decision needs to be made. We feel at the center we're ready to convene that meeting. We know we're not done and we have a lot of work. But what we can do is we can put CEOs that represent, I'll never say procurement power again. That's the one thing I've learned here. But I will say market force <laughs> because it takes the market to make this happen. We can put in less than two handfuls enough CEOs that represent approaching $300 billion worth of procurement or revenue yearly. And I think the CEOs from the, the medical device vendors and the solution providers are ready to sit down with them. I don't hear anybody resisting the drive for comprehensive interoperability and data liquidity. So we would offer to convene that meeting and organize it with four tracks. The first track is the person. So how does the person become the unit economic of healthcare? The second track is the episode in transitions of care where clinical decision uh, support is critical. The third would be network to network. By then, Don will have, have uh, launched, hopefully, his, his next step uh, in networks. And then the last one is how do we deal with the marketplace? So we will focus on trying to, you know, the other the other favorite saying, when there's lead in the air, there's hope, right? Is continuing this great momentum and really starting to elevate, because, yeah, you know, as, as, a, as a citizen of the U.S., if the CEOs aren't going to step up, then we probably should know about it. But in every other industry, they've come together, and I think they're going to come together here. So we would welcome feedback and interest on such an event uh, and be happy to organize it and lead it. Thank, Thank you. you very much.
Thank you, Ed, for that generous offer. It's a timely one, and, um, uh, and thanks to each of you for this extraordinary day. Um, the day was um, very deep uh, in insight uh, and, and com conviction uh, and commitment. Uh, certainly was candid with respect to the challenges, um, but even ro more robust in many ways with respect to the possibilities going forward. Uh, and that's, uh, we've had a flavor of that with uh, Ed's comment just now and with the comments of many of you uh, throughout the course of the day. Uh, you have the deep um, and sincere gratitude of the National Academy of Medicine, all of us here, for uh, what you've brought to the day's discussion, for lending your wisdom, your leadership uh, to such a generative discussion, uh, and of course even more for what you'll do uh, as you move uh, 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 forward in your own activities and, in, and with the collaborative activities that we hope will emerge. Um, our commitment in the National Academy of Medicine uh, is uh, both the general and specific. Uh, the general commitment is to do everything we can to uh, foster uh, the uh, evolution of a seamlessly and continuous learning health system. Uh, the specific is to do everything we can to uh, facilitate the kind of collaboration uh, that Ed's referred to and that many of you referred to uh, as necessary moving forward. Uh, and um, we have only two asks of you as you, uh, 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 as you uh, head home and as we uh, move to our um, reception uh, in, the, in the next minute or so. One is uh, to bear in mind uh, that this is a work in progress. And so what we want you to do, uh, if you can devote a, uh, a few minutes of conversation and thought uh, to the sorts of things that will make the publication, which you've received in draft form, uh, a better, more foundational uh, contribution uh, from which all of us and our colleagues around the nation uh, can move forward. So we'd like as many uh, specific comments uh, that you uh, can lend uh, to that uh, improvement process. And the second is with respect to um, uh, the uh, healthcare organization leaders. What, in addition to the uh, taking Ed up on his offer, are the sorts of things uh, that the leaders of our healthcare organizations can do uh, to advance progress in the swiftest manner possible? So um, this is, remains a, an open docket. Uh, again, I want to emphasize the thanks uh, very much to each of you, obviously to Peter uh, and his colleagues on the planning committee and the author group, um, and, and to each of our presenters, and finally, but most importantly, uh, to uh, the staff here who worked under uh, Dr. Wang's uh, leadership uh, to help bring us here. And so we can close the meeting with a hearty round of gratitude on you. <laughs> Please join us uh, for a reception and to be continued. Goodbye.